And on to our next speaker, who leads customer and partner co-creation for Vodafone Business. She works with some of the world's largest organizations to bring tech and individuals together to create new business outcomes. She's worked across Europe, the USA, Africa, and Asia, and is an expert in the digitalization of healthcare. Please welcome Katrina Lowe's. Thank you, Greg, and uh, hello, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be with you all today. And I just want to spend a few minutes posing a question and thinking about, will empowered patients drive the digitalization of hospitals? Because there's a lot of conversation at the moment about how can we digitalize healthcare? A lot of investment coming from Europe into digitalization. And I think it's a it's a term that we sort of bandy around a lot, but we don't really think about what are the drivers of moving that forward in healthcare. And I think one of the things that we've really seen through the pandemic is just how precious our hospitals, our healthcare workers and our health systems really are. But we've also seen how fragile they are and quite often um, healthcare workers are not empowered with the sort of tools that we've had access to in the business world. So um, when lockdown happened and many, many businesses sent their employees to work from home, they were already equipped with a, a set of digital tools that are very much like the tools that we have in our daily lives. Um, and I think we're very, very used to self-serving. Um, uh, and just as I've talked to people in their daily lives about does your daily digital experience live up with your healthcare experience? And there's a there's a pretty big gap. So, for instance, I've got a, a colleague who's in late stage pregnancy. She's really quite surprised that every time she goes to the hospital for her checkups, she's carrying around a paper folder when most of her life is managed through a smartphone or a tablet. Um, in some of our research, we've talked to a junior doctor um, and in one night shift, they kept a track of all of the pager bleeps they got and they were getting bleeped every 30 seconds for three hours with absolutely no way of understanding what the priority of those requests were. Now, I started work in technology in the paging division 30 years ago and we thought it was a you know, a, a challenging technology back then. But to think that some of the most critical uh, communication in healthcare today happens through technology that's 30 years old, I think that's an interesting uh, challenge and a, and a question we've got to look at. I think from Vodafone's perspective, why are we uh, involved in, in healthcare? Well, our purpose is to positively impact a billion lives. And one of the ways that technology can do that is by giving greater access to healthcare for more people. And I loved that uh, conversation just at the end there between the two of you where the talk turned to the most precious thing you can have is time. So how can we use some of the basic tools we take advantage of in our life um, to buy that time in uh, hospitals? Um, and we're looking at some interesting ways of doing that. Uh, one of the things that are, you know, I like at the moment is we're using drones to deliver time sensitive medicines when conventional transport can't get there um, or remotely connecting experts together so that you cut out the time needed to travel between hospitals or even between buildings in a, in a hospital campus. Because if you think about just how digital our lives are right now, we have a level of expectation in the way that things work and how we access knowledge, uh, how we buy things. And there's just four easy examples here on the screen of, of industries that have rapidly transformed in the last 18 months. So grocery delivery, um, purchasing a house, so uh, I recently bought a flat without seeing the flat, without meeting the estate agent, without talking to the solicitor in the office. Everything was done digitally online. One of the biggest purchases that an individual could make. Online banking. We all transact, we buy, we sell online. And e even exercise. I think the pandemic has really challenged what was a face-to-face -face industry to figure out how to use digital tools in a better way. Um, and I think that 
if you look at the inside of a hospital, then um, that experience inside a hospital can be a very far world away from some of the things that we we uh, do in a daily basis. And it's almost like we um, we stop at the door as we go into the clinic or the hospital. So why is it so hard to, to digitalize healthcare? I think that's a big question we're all asking ourselves right now. Because patient and clinician expectations are changing fast. And it's a phenomenon that we saw in the health in, in the business world probably about 10 years ago. So as smartphones and low-cost apps in the cloud started to become more and more available, employees got frustrated with the speed at which their organizations were changing. And they started to find new ways to do their work in a more efficient way, to overcome local hurdles, to change the way local processes might have been putting extra time into decision-making steps. And I think who knows better how to create extra time um, in a working process than the people that are actually putting the process or the, the policy into place. So big organizations started to listen to their employees and started to incorporate uh, digital tools like collaboration, like presence, um, the ability to, to be together without being in the same place. And I think they've seen some dramatic gains in efficiency, uh, in faster uh, decision making and um, the way that teams can come together without needing to plan for um, travel or uh, that sort of time out of, of working. And I think what we're seeing right now is history is repeating itself within the healthcare industry. So patients are more empowered and there's a whole digital native um, clinician and employee group that just expect things to work the way that uh, they do outside of, of uh, the, the walls of the hospital. And I think that um, the quote here on the screen really stood out to me in some of the research we did recently. And this was a doctor that said, I'm better informed about the progress of my Amazon parcel than I am knowing when my test results that I'm waiting for are going to be delivered. So they feel better informed about the delivery of a parcel than how to plan their time during the day before the test results get back to them. And I think that's just a, a very simple um, example of how people's expectations are moving faster than perhaps uh, some of our healthcare systems can keep up with. And until we can bridge that gap in healthcare, people will start to find their own ways of doing things. And, you know, we've got examples of um, a, a surgeon that now takes photographs of a post-operative wound and texts them to a colleague to make sure the handover notes are with the right person. You know, people will find their own workarounds the way they did uh, in the in the business world today. And so the question for us as policymakers, as administrators, as uh, 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 technology companies is how do we design these systems in a way that they're easy to use, easy to learn and uh, easy to build into the way that you work? And so. Bridging that gap between daily life and healthcare means that we need to support people. It's not just about giving them the tools and expecting them to be able to work them into their, their daily working routine. It means that we need to support the clinicians with good training, but also in the way that we design and deploy uh, basic communication tools. Um, the more we empower people to manage their uh, health at home, the more their expectations of what uh, will happen when they get into clinics and hospitals will increase exponentially. And I think if I just go back to that example of the colleague that is carrying her paper file around during her pregnancy, her expectations are already way higher than uh, the experience that is, uh, uh, is happening uh, in her treatment. And I think uh, there's a, a lot of talk about the, uh, the shift to P4 medicine, for instance, and this idea of participatory medicine. You know, we've got lots of examples of people monitoring their own healthcare. There are plenty of wearable devices. 
how are we going to bridge the, all of that data that's being collected outside of healthcare and bring it into healthcare in a way that it can be meaningful and, um, and it, can, it can give insight. And we could be talking simple tools here. So we've got an example of where um, single sign-on meant that uh, clinicians were saving two hours a day not signing into multiple systems over and over or uh, a, a doctor that was spending seven minutes of a 10 minute bedside consultation logging into different systems to explain to the patient what was going to happen next. Um, we've got examples of nurses that are spending up to two hours a day tracking down equipment. And when they do find it, it's either not charged or it isn't in a workable order. And so uh, it's not just about technology. It's about changing behavior, changing processes, changing policies to free up that time that we know is getting consumed by um, some of the inefficient practices today. And to do that, we've got to drive a culture of digitalization. It's about supporting everybody with training, but it's not just all down to how you use the tools. It's about making sure that we address the processes that are not designed to make the most of the technology that's available. It's making sure that we can improve communication between patients and healthcare professionals in whatever means is the most effective way. And I think it's about policymakers, healthcare providers and technology companies coming together to make sure that we don't just think about the infrastructure or the tools, we think about the ways that we create knowledge, we create capability, and most of all, we give everybody the confidence um, that the, the digital technologies that we're working with today can improve healthcare and create more time with patients. Because there's a new wave of technology coming, and I know we're going to hear a lot about that as the, the day progresses today. So things like 5G, edge computing, extended reality, artificial intelligence, we're already enabling experts to consult patients remotely. Um, and it's as if the patient was in the hospital, but the, the expert doesn't need to travel. We're using mixed reality training to deliver more lifelike ways of experiencing um, what the, the procedure or the, the, the treatment is going to be like when you are in front of patients. And uh, it's about proactive um, maintenance. So we're, we're making sure that not only do we know where the equipment is, but that we are tracking the performance of the equipment and maintenance gets scheduled in to extend the life of the equipment rather than um, to, re to, to respond when something goes wrong. And I think um, if we look at what this is doing for a specialist team like a surgical team, then there's some really exciting developments. Back to that uh, example I gave in the business world where employees started to design their own ways of working. We've got some fantastic examples of surgeons solving their own clinical problems with technology. And we're doing some work with uh, Proximy, their technology platform, and the University Hospital of Wales uh, to give access to uh, surgeons and clinicians into live procedures to coach and to advise. Now, um, Dr. Nadine Hashash Haman, she's speaking later on uh, during the, the event today, so I'm not going to say very much about Proximy. But it's an exciting example to us about how we can combine 5G technology with Proximy's expertise and uh, the digitalization of a hospital like the University of Wales um, to really bring new ways of working that enable um, more patients to be treated and better outcomes to be delivered. And so I think what's really important here is that we have to enable people through a culture of digital first activities. Um, we've got to be able to give them access to the basic tools so that they can do the breakthroughs like Proximy uh, and many other examples of companies uh, that we see today. We've got to reduce the amount of policy and procedures that were built before the technology uh, was introduced. And we've got to reduce that clash of multiple types of technology that don't necessarily integrate with each other well. I think that if we can really focus on helping everybody communicate better, make decisions faster, 
we can then start to think about taking the services of hospitals and the good that is done inside the hospital out into the community beyond the walls of the, the building. And we, we're only just at the beginning of the power that these new technologies will bring to healthcare. So let's make sure that we spend some time getting the best use out of the tools we've got today. Because as far as we're concerned, technology isn't the hero here. It's the enabler of heroes. Thank you. Katrina, thank you so much. A uh, couple of questions from me, and then we've got a couple of questions from the audience. Um, I, I guess, you know, the, the, the obvious question is we saw a massive sort of, you know, shift during the pandemic to technology such as telemedicine. Um, and I'm interested to get your thoughts on, do you think that the, obviously COVID has accelerated, you know, digital transformation generally? How do you think that's going to play out in, in the coming sort of months and years? That's a, a really good question, because I think it plays right to the question about the digital divide. So what we're seeing is if you are a digital native, if you're used to being digital first, um, consulting with a, a doctor on screen is just an extension of what you already do. If you're older, if you're less confident with technology, if you don't have the means to afford um, a, a smartphone or, a, or a, a laptop, then if we're not careful, you're going to get excluded from access to really great um, healthcare provision. And I think we've seen lots of studies that if we can get through um, triage and, and initial uh, investigation on screen, when you get in front of the, the clinician, the time is better used in that face-to-face uh, appointment. So I think uh, we're doing a lot of work with policymakers and influencers to try and get across the message that um, there's a lot that governments uh, and uh, influencing organisations can do to really think about how are we going to bridge that digital divide. Because the technology can enable you to see a doctor in, in an hour where, um, you know, potentially you may have waited a, a little while to, to get face to face. And it's, it's definitely um, a future for us, but it's not going to be adopted naturally by everybody. Yeah, and I guess that, that kind of uh, that access question also kind of leads on to another question, which is around digital literacy. I mean, not just from patients, but also from healthcare workers on the front line. Uh, how, how do you think we can kind of work in order to ensure that, you know, that there is this you know, general literacy amongst both providers, but also patients as well? Well, I think uh, technology definitely has a part to play, but so does the way that we look at training and literacy and how we pass on knowledge. And I think that, um, you know, I've seen a number of training uh, packages that are, you know, quite long. You sit in front of a screen um, and you, you, you go through the training. And what, what the world's moving to now is more uh, involvement in gamification, better use of graphics, shorter and more repetitive training. And I think there's a great opportunity for the training designers, the technology companies and um, the HR organizations to just look at a different way of delivering how people absorb knowledge. And just a final question though, as, as you look at all the kind of the major trends that you're seeing sort of in digital at the moment, which one do you think has the kind of like the most possibility to really have impact across the healthcare sector? <gasps> Wow, that's a question. I um, I don't think that I would leave it to one. I think what we've seen with technology is it, it's a great way of in, inspiring people to solve problems that everybody thought were unthinkable before. So I think remote access to expertise has got to be uh, a real leading um, transformation uh, activity and everything from the more comfortable we get at sharing data so that experts can come together virtually and and work on what that intelligence is telling them right the way through to you know the example I use that Proximy has built which is to have an expert with you live in a procedure even though they may be hundreds of miles away so I think um, we've definitely seen in the pandemic, the more we can bring the experts and the leading thinkers together without them needing to travel in a safe way, um, I think that's going to deliver lots of different benefits in many different pathways. Katrina, thank you so much for joining us here at Wired Health Tech. Uh, really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you.